he is the absolute being in the middle realm. When he stamps his foot, the mountains blow. When he leaps, the heavens are within his reach. If he swings the sword, the tidal wave parts. The one we are talking about is the heavenly demon, the most powerful being on earth. His will is the will of God. And right now, the heavenly demon is fighting myriad sentient beings. The heavenly demon slices off a sentient's head with his absolute sword and destroys his body with a single attack. This fight is happening in a different time and space. The heavenly demon stops and says, It seems like I've been fighting with you for ages. He asks Sentient, Let's get this over with. Sentient is still alive even after his head is cut off. He looks at the heavenly demon and says, If you kill me, you will be trapped in the eternal abyss of the underworld. He asks the heavenly demon, Do you intend to die with me? The heavenly demon laughs and points his sword at Sentient, saying, Let's tackle complex issues step by step. First, let's start with you dying. Sentient says, is that your intention? Is that the reason I lost? Sentient looks at the heavenly demon angrily. The heavenly demon is prepared, and with lightning speed, he covers the distance and stabs Sentient. The sword is aimed at his head. But as the Sentient, the energy in his body starts to come out in the form of lightning. All the space gets covered by the light. And in that moment, heavenly demon tells something to the Sentient being. The next moment, Heavenly Demon's whole body gets inside that light. Sentient praises Heavenly Demon because he is the first one to pass through Sentient and cross the world. So, how's this story? I know, I know you all are confused about why Heavenly Demon is fighting a Sentient being in space. So, for you to understand, let's start from the beginning. This story goes back to the Ming Dynasty at the Imperial Palace in the Forbidden City. Originally, the Imperial Palace was supposed to be the most splendid and massive structure within the palace grounds because it was where the Son of Heaven, the Emperor, resided. However, that was not the reality. The Heavenly God Palace boasted a much more splendid and majestic presence compared to the Imperial Palace. This means that the Master of the Heavenly God Palace held a higher position than the Emperor of the Great Ming Empire. The master of the Heavenly God Palace, the leader of the Heavenly Demon Sect, is Jin Yuxiong. He is the absolute ruler with immense power in the Central Plains. But for him, his life is like hell. Yuxiong is lying on the bed and complains that today is so freaking boring. Yuxiong says, I must be crazy, trying to unify the martial arts to enjoy a life of wealth and honor. He jumps and sits on the bed and complains that I shouldn't have taken on the role of the sect leader in the first place. No, more importantly, I should not have devoted myself to the new cult. He shouts, no, I just shouldn't have been born. A guy who was behind Yu Xiong reminds Yu Xiong that his subordinates are listening. Yu Xiong gets angry, he says, what about it? Can't I even speak now with my mouth open? That guy behind Yu Xiong is Xin Zhecheng, a disciple of the Heavenly Demon Sect. He tells Yu Xiong that as the sect leader, he should maintain his integrity. Yu Xiong again shouts, No, I'm not going to keep it. But then he calms himself and asks, Zhecheng, are you standing behind me right now to guard me? Zhecheng says, Yes, sect leader. Yu Xiong starts to laugh like crazy and asks, How will you protect me? It's not a job for a tiger to protect a dragon. Yu Xiong starts to float around Zhecheng and asks him if he can defeat Yu Xiong. Zhecheng says, I know I fall short compared to the sect master. However, in dire situations, I have the ability to die in place of the sect master. Yesyong starts to cry, asking when exactly do things get dire then. He really wants things to become dire. He asks Zhecheng why don't they have something like a secret force trying to overthrow the heavenly demon sect, lurking in the darkness, or external invasion, the rebellion of the vested right who refuse to acknowledge him. Zhecheng replies, I've taken care of all the elders who were plotting. As for the external invasion, my subordinates in the western regions are investigating. Zhecheng gets in his demon mode and says, There seems to be such a danger from the elders of the sect. I must eliminate them all. Yes Young tries to calm him and asks why kill them. How much longer do those elderly people live anyway? Zhecheng replies, There's a possibility that the elders might harbor dissatisfaction towards the sect master, so I will kill them all. Yes Yong tells him not to do it because it's pitiful. Zhecheng says, then I'll assign a special surveillance team on elders. On days when even a hint of suspicion arises, that would be the end. When Yes Yong saw him talk about all that, he felt sad. He thought that because of him, the elderly are now under surveillance. Suddenly, Yes Yong feels something. He pulls out his sword and says there is one person at the main gate, and he feels impressive. He hopes it's a skilled assassin. He tells Zhecheng that if it's an assassin, I'll be the one to fight. Zhecheng asks him what kind of assassin would come through the main gate. Yes Yong says, who knows, maybe it's someone exceptionally clever, choosing the front entrance as a strategic move. Well, the assassin they were talking about is a guy with a big build and looks kinda scary. 
That guy goes inside, and in front of Ye Xiong, he shouts, May the heavenly demon rule the world. He kneels down in front of Ye Xiong because he is Sangram, an assassin of the heavenly demon sect. Ye Xiong tells him not to do that as he doesn't like that kind of treatment. Sangram asks for forgiveness. Ye Xiong says it's all right. He asks Sangram that it took about two years. How are the colleagues in the western region? Ye Xiong is curious because he heard that the western region has firearms and technology far more advanced than the Ming dynasty. He says if there are martial artists in the central plains, is it true that in the western region, there are practitioners of magic known as sorcerers? What Ye Xiong is curious about is how strong they are. He laughs like a madman and says if there's a formidable enemy, I can't just stay put as the guardian of the central plains. He asks Sangram, are they incredibly strong? It seems like I have to fight. Sangram hesitates to say as he has to follow proper formalities. Ye Xiong couldn't understand anything and gets angry. He tells Sangram to forget the formality and just say it quickly. Sangram looks at Juching. Juching says, the master wants it, so just speak comfortably without formality. When Sangrin hears that, he gets himself comfortable and shouts, it was fucking hell. Ye Xiong was very disappointed to hear that Sangrin managed to subdue 70% of the leaders of the magic faction. He asks Sangrin, didn't he tell him not to pick a fight too casually? Sangrin replies that it all happened due to the wind that is pushing us into being perceived as an evil force. Sangrin says, I refrained as much as possible from causing casualties. Ye Xiong asks him if they are that weak. Sangrin tells Ye Xiong that their abilities were excellent, but it seemed that magic had evolved more as a skill than a combat technique. Things like making it rain or communicating from a distant place. Ye Xiong gets very sad and disappointed after hearing all that. Sangrin presents a book and a magic crystal to Ye Xiong and asks him to take a look at this once. Ye Xiong looks at that book and asks what is it. Sangrin replies, I received this mysterious item from the leader of the Western Region Mages faction. According to the mages, they claim their ultimate goal is alchemy. Ye Xiong is confused about what alchemy is. Sangrin tells him that it's a technique of combining lower tier materials to create higher tier materials. For example, turning stones into gold. Ye Xiong looks at that book and asks Sangrin if isn't that something those street swindlers often do. Sangrin said no, there are actual successful cases. He told Ye Xiong that the ultimate goal of alchemy is said to be entry into a higher realm. And this book contains the methods, and the gem is one of the ingredients. Ye Xiong starts to read that book. He asks Sangrin, higher realm refers to what? Juching says, isn't it something like the legendary martial arts realm? Sangrin replies that a mage envoy has come with him, and it would be good to ask them. They call the mage envoy, Mulder. Mulder is the representative of the mage envoy corps from the western region. Ye Xiong asks, can you create what's in this book? Mulder says, in theory, it's possible, but in reality, it's not feasible. Ye Xiong stops for a second because he is confused. He was interested and asks Mulder, how did you learn our language so quickly? Mulder tells him that there's a method that makes it easy to learn foreign languages. Ye Xiong is impressed. He says, indeed, you guys have advanced in technology. Ye Xiong thought they lost to Sangram, so he assumed they were weak. Mulder doesn't say anything because he is amazed to see that Ye Xiong truly has formidable magic power. By naked eyes, no one can see it, but as a mage, Mulder can see Ye Xiong's magic power. Mulder can't believe Ye Xiong is perfectly harnessing such magical power inside himself. Ye Xiong asks Mulder why is it impossible to produce? Is it theoretically perfect? Mulder replies that there is no energy to activate the gate. Ye Xiong gets confused as to what Mulder means by gate and energy. Mulder asks for forgiveness because when he translates another language, proper nouns don't translate well. Mulder says gate is the Ming dynasty language for the door of pleasure, and you can think of energy as vitality. When Ye Xiong hears that, he says, if it's vitality for the door of pleasure, there's absolutely no issue with that. Mulder asks him, as he doesn't understand what Ye Xiong means. Ye Xiong asks Mulder if he knows about female practitioners. He tells Mulder that they're beings who seduce men and gather yang energy through the absorption technique. Ye Xiong gets excited while thinking about them. He says, I will go there, have a meal together and take a bath as well. Juching is very worried. He says, Master, please maintain your composure. Many eyes are watching. Ye Xiong corrects his composure and says, it has become a habit to chat. He says to Mulder, you're saying you lack energy. Mulder says, yes. Ye Xiong asks Mulder why do you insist on inheriting a technique that cannot be executed? Was this something highly valuable to you all? Mulder says, there is one possibility. According to records, about 100 years ago, the triplets once tried to open the gate. It is said that there was a time when they dispersed magical energy and the gate was halfway open. 
The total energy required to open the gate can be filled when multiple mages gather. But the issue is that an extremely pure magical power is required. But each person has a slightly different nature of magical power. Guess Yong asks him if it doesn't mix perfectly due to the different nature of magical power. Mulder says, yes, if there were five master mages along with the triplets, it might be possible. We need immense magical power to open the gate, so it's impossible for one person to possess. Yes Yong listens to everything, then calls Juching and tells him to send everyone within a radius of a hundred yards out. Juching follows his order. Then Yes Yong reads the presence of everyone within five hundred yards and tells Mulder that everyone has left. He tells Mulder that now the only ones left within a hundred yards are you and me. Mulder is amazed to see that Yes Yong read the presence of everyone within five hundred yards just now. He doesn't know what is about to come. Yes Yong asks him to look carefully and says, This is the total amount of energy I have, in your language. Mulder is confused, but his confusion immediately changes into amazement. Yes Yong releases the internal energy that he has in his body. His body starts to glow with blue and green light. Mulder can feel a heavy pressure on his body. He thought how can one person accumulate such a dense magical power? He knows that if he releases this much power, his body would explode. While releasing that much energy, Yes Young says, at some point, having too much inner power becomes uncomfortable. Moreover, my inner power doesn't naturally dissipate because the binding force is too strong. That's why I usually compress it and hide it well, otherwise, ordinary people will die. Mulder gets too scared after seeing Yes Young's increasing power. Yes Young looks like a god to Mulder. Yes Young stops releasing the energy and asks Mulder what he thinks. With this level of energy, can Yes Young open that gate? Mulder is still lying on the ground unable to stand. Now he understands. Before unleashing his power, Yes Young had sealed his magical power, and what remained was just the residue after sealing. Mulder starts to cry because he is astonished by that residue. He lowers his head in front of Yes Young and replies, Of course, sect leader. Yes Young gets confused why Mulder is calling him sect leader. He asks, Why are you suddenly calling me the sect leader? The mages call me the supreme being. While crying, Mulder says, I want to devote myself to the heavenly demon sect. Yes Young asks why he does that. Mulder replies, There is someone who has reached the ultimate level. How could my body and mind choose a different path and different leader? Yes Young doesn't like where this is going. He tells Mulder to get lost because he is not their leader. While crying more, Mulder replies, You are my leader. But when Mulder looks up, he sees that Yes Young is not there. Mulder is surprised to see the leader disappearing suddenly. He thinks, is this the blink mentioned in the legends? And just like that, one year passes. One year later, at the Heavenly God Palace backyard, there is a device, and in the middle, a pink crystal is placed. Yes Young asks Mulder if this is the gate he was talking about. Mulder replies, yes, leader, I made it together with the mages of the Magic Association. Yes Young is a little confused because all he can see is that pink crystal jewel. He asks Mulder if this is it. Mulder tells Yes Young that it's just buried and invisible. A massive altar has been created underground. Yes Yong and others are surprised to hear that. Yes Yong releases some of his internal energy and directs it towards the crystal. He says, You are right, Mulder. I can feel a strange energy from this jewel. It's a mixture of positive and negative energy. Yes Yong says, This is interesting, and asks Mulder what he should do. Mulder says, Sect leader, you just need to pour your inner power evenly toward the jewel. Yes Yong understands everything and places his hand on the crystal. He says it could be dangerous, so everyone should stay away. Yes Young first concentrates and gathers the internal energy from his body to his hand. Then he immediately releases all that into the crystal. There is a huge blast of spiritual energy, but that crystal absorbs all the spiritual energy. Yes Young is amazed to see that. He says, this is amazing. If I just pour out this much inner power, even a thousand years old perennial iron would shatter into pieces. Yet, there's not even a tremor in this jewel. He smiles and says, my pride is hurt. Yes Young increases the amount of spiritual energy he was releasing. His eyes start to shine, showing that Yes Young is serious now. Yes Young is smiling like a devil that is about to get the soul that was promised. Others who were watching from afar also start to feel the pressure of Yes Young's energy. They unleash protective spells to avoid being affected. Mulder is too shocked. He says, this can't be happening. Now he knows that the supreme being of the central plains is like a legendary dragon. Yes Young is releasing so much energy that even the crystal can't absorb it. It even starts to crack. Suddenly, it stops all activities, and then all the energy that it had absorbed starts to convert into spiritual power and shoots into the sky. The sky and the heavenly demon sect start to shine brightly like a star. 
There is smoke everywhere, but when the smoke settles, everyone is too shocked to see what is in front of them. It was a success, and the gate is truly complete. Everyone is amazed and says, the sect leader is truly invincible. Everyone cheers that the heavenly demon sect rules the world. Sangren gets ready to go into the gate. Yesyong asks him why he's the one going. Sangren asks, doesn't the leader firmly believe that there must be another civilization inside? Yesyong says that may be true, but beyond the gate, it could be dangerous. Wouldn't it be better to find other candidates now? Sangren laughs and says, I've been bored since returning from the western region. I find this more enjoyable, so I will go first and have a great time. He says his farewell to everyone and says that if something dangerous happens, the sect leader will come to save him, just like in the survival camp training. Yes Young smiles and says, all right, go and come back safely. Sangrin is respected by the members and disciples of the Heavenly Demon Sect for not abusing his power, so he was one of the three members of the Heavenly Demon Sect who belonged to the survival camp with Yes Young. Without hesitation, he enters the gate, and even though everyone believes he will return safely, ten years have passed, and Sangrin has not come back. Internally, sect members tried to gather additional reinforcements, but Yes Young opposed it. If it's really dangerous, it would be meaningless for weaker individuals in martial arts than Sangrin to go, so Yesyong didn't allow it. After Sangrin left, Yesyong would come from time to time and sit in front of the gate and drink while talking about old days. Just like that, another 80 years have passed relentlessly. Yesyong was again drinking and complaining that why everyone left him behind and went away. There were hundreds of graves behind Yesyong. Yesyong told Sangren that now the descendants are leaving the heavenly demon sect, and in this empty heavenly palace without any close friends. Even if I achieved immortality and returned to a young body with the rejuvenation technique, what joy is there in living alone? He throws the bottle and says, it seems that tombstones won't increase anymore. He stands in front of the gate and wonders if he can have his tombstone, or perhaps if he suddenly disappeared. Who knows, a legend like the tales of the five-colored celestial lion might emerge. Yes Yong releases the spiritual energy and opens the gate again. This time he himself enters the gate, and on that day, Heavenly Palace lost its master. On the other side at Seoul Station, South Korea, by traveling through the gate, Yes Yong arrives in modern Korea. But because of the pollution, Yes Yong is continuously coughing, and as he was wearing Miram World's clothes that make him look like a cosplayer, he attracts everyone's attention. Yes Young says, it's good to arrive in a new world. What's this murky air? He covers his nose with his hand. Yes Young wonders if there's a decent guest house to rest in. Deciding that he should go to a place where he can feel a lot of human energy, Yes Young enters the railway station. And when he sees inside the station, he thinks this is a guest house. He praises that this guest house is truly magnificent and spacious. When he sees beggars sleeping in a corner, he thinks that is top quality bedding. However, the beggars are looking at him with suspicion. Yes Young is embarrassed because it's been a long time. Instead of receiving the admiration and respect of the masses, he is now met with guarded eyes. One beggar asks Yes Young something, but he doesn't understand anything. It's normal because Korean people talk in Korean, and Yes Young doesn't know anything about it. The beggar keeps talking in Korean, and because of that, Yes Young started to get annoyed. Yes Young needs to understand each other to have a conversation but suddenly it rings to him. He remembers how Mulder immediately learned their language. Yes Young decides to use the magic of language acquisition that Mulder taught him. Yes Young analyzes the beggar in front of him using that magic. The beggar is just looking at Yes Young. After Yes Young learns the Korean language, he tries to talk to the beggar. The beggar is surprised and doesn't reply to him. Yes Young gets angry thinking that the beggar is ignoring him. Yes Young's voice sounds a bit different to the beggar. He asks Yes Young about his hometown. Yes Young replies that he is from Korea. The beggar tells him that Korea is the name of a country, it's not a town. The beggar asks what Yes Young wants. Yes Young asks him to get him a place to sleep. When the beggar thought Yes Young is in the same industry as them, he thought Yes Young is also a beggar. The beggar told Yes Young his name is Kwon Kyuni and asked Yes Young to call him Kwon Hyung. Yes Young asked him what he meant by Hyung. Yes Young said, I've spent ages dissecting revolutions, and I've been over 100 years old for a long while now. When the beggar heard all the things Yes Young said about himself, he thought Yes Young has been hit in the head. He said, no wonder this young man's homeless. The beggar took Yes Young to Mr. Kim, a respected member and the boss of all the homeless people. The beggar asked Kim if all the rooms were taken. Mr. Kim said there are still some left and asked the beggar why he is asking. The beggar pointed at Yes Young and told Mr. Kim that this guy has nowhere to sleep. Mr. Kim was surprised at how this happened. 
When they saw Ye Seong's clothing and hair, they thought he wasn't a cosplayer or something. The beggar gave a signal to Mr. Kim and told him that Ye Seong is crazy in the head. When Ye Seong saw that many people, he thought about using language acquisition magic on them. He thought if he used it on more people, the acquisition gets a lot smoother. He analyzed all of them together. When Mr. Kim heard about Ye Seong's situation, he said, it's good for us to help each other. He asked Ye Seong to come and take a seat. Ye Seong, who has now learned Korean from that many people, properly thanked Mr. Kim for his hospitality. When that beggar saw Ye Seong talking properly in Korean, he was shocked. He got angry because he thought Ye Seong was from the city. He shouted at Ye Seong, were you messing around with us? When Mr. Kim saw that beggar shouting at Kim, he got angry and told that beggar to get out of his zone if he is going to cause a scene. That beggar, while cursing, left from there. Mr. Kim told Ye Seong not to worry about that guy and asked him to come sit with them. Ye Seong sat beside Mr. Kim and thanked him. But suddenly, Ye Seong started to feel weakness in his body. Kim noticed Ye Seong and asked if he is sick. Ye Seong said, I'm fine, just feeling a little dizzy. Ye Seong remembered the masters in the West telling him that using language magic on just two people was tiring. Now Ye Seong knows that it takes more out of him to use it on five people at once. But rather than feeling dizzy, the problem is that Ye Seong's inner strength is reaching its limits. It was because he lost most of his strength just coming here. He lost them because he met that sentient being at the gate. Ye Seong still doesn't know what that unprecedented existence was. Kim introduced himself as Kim In Cheng and asked Ye Seong about his name. Ye Seong was just going to tell Kim his real name. But he stopped, he felt a bit uneasy giving strangers his real name and decided to use the name he had in his other life. Ye Seong told Kim that his name is Wangu. Wangu's name sounds very Chinese. Kim asked Ye Seong about his age, and Ye Seong replied that he stopped counting when he turned 100. Kim asked Ye Seong if that's his setup. Ye Seong got confused and asked Kim if that sounds like a setup. Kim thought that this guy is interesting for sure, though he does feel bad for Ye Seong. Kim asked Ye Seong if he drinks and poured some saju for him. Ye Seong said, I've never had any alcohol. But Ye Seong knew that by not receiving the drink offered to him, he would show disrespect towards the person offering the drink. So, Ye Seong, without any hesitation, drank the saju. But when he drank the saju, the freshness hit Ye Seong immediately like lightning. Ye Seong could not control his emotions and facial expressions, as this was his first time having such a sweet and refreshing drink. But from Kim's perspective, Ye Seong looked weirder, as Ye Seong liked Saju. He asked Kim if there is a better drink than this around. Beggars sitting around were surprised to hear Ye Seong. They told him that it's the cheapest one out there, it's what penniless bastards can afford. Ye Seong asked that beggar if he is saying he can drink more delicious alcohol if he has more money. He again asked that beggar how he makes money. The beggar asked Ye Seong if he thinks they would still be like this if they knew. Another beggar told Ye Seong about one of his friends who was at Yongsen Station. He had an awakening some time ago, and now he drives a bunch of foreign cars. Kim asks those beggars what they are waiting for, saying the sky is clearing as they speak. Another beggar calls the government bastards, questioning when guys like them will get a chance like that. He mentions the possibility of the government taking all the resources, leaving them always as beggars. When Ye Seong hears about the gate from those beggars, he is surprised. He asks Kim if there are gates here too. Kim tells Ye Seong that there are lots of gates here. Ye Seong is surprised to hear that and asks Kim about the one who made them. Kim tells Ye Seong that not a single person on earth knows. Ye Seong thinks about how he wouldn't be able to make one without all his experience levels, wondering if the name gate is the only thing that's the same or if it's a real thing. Lost in thought, Kim asks Ye Seong how come he doesn't know all this information about the world, questioning if he doesn't remember his life before now. Ye Seong says it's a long story. Kim pours another glass for Ye Seong and asks him to try this and tell his story, as they have plenty of time. Ye Seong, with a sad expression, says, where do I even start? He continues his story, saying he was the prince of Korea. Ye Seong notes that it was enough proof for everyone to believe he is crazy but continues his story. He says that because he was the youngest, he was far from succeeding the throne. Soldiers revolted, usurping the royal court. Ye Seong crossed the Ming border alone with the help of his servants but was captured and sold as a slave to the mountain fire starters. He reflects on whether that was good or bad luck, considering the Ming dynasty's situation with the orthodox faction and the evil faction joining forces against the demonic cult. The place he was sold to was Jiang Deming's secret organization, the Extinction Rebellion. Raised as a human weapon of slaughter by the exterminators, Ye Seong fought in the war against the demonic cult. The battle was fierce, and the battlefield became a site of mass destruction. 
However, the demonic cult ended in a ridiculous manner, and the orthodox faction considered Yesiong too powerful to be kept alive. They decided to destroy their weapon instead of risking leaving it alive. Yesiong did not accept that fate and, along with 13 other exterminators, ran away from the clan and lived together. They continuously ran and fought for their lives, with only three of them surviving in the end, Sangram, Yesiong, and Sin Juchung. The three sought revenge against the orthodox faction, and their blades were sharpened by absorbing what was left of the demonic cult. That was the birth of the heavenly demon cult, which governed the Ming dynasty and all of Murum. Yesiong finishes the story, and when he stops, he assumes that everyone is too moved to say anything. However, when he looks in front, he sees that many beggars have gathered to hear his story. The beggars find Yesiong's story interesting, thinking he is telling a paid-to-read novel. Yesiong tells them to mind their words, stating that those days were too miserable to be judged like that. Now, everyone is excited to hear what happened next. A beggar expresses having read some martial arts novels, but never seen any stories like this one. He asks Yesiong if the heavenly demon cult got their revenge against the orthodox faction, and how strong the main character was. Yesiong gets very angry and shouts that this isn't some exciting martial arts novel. Those were times of struggle and survival. The beggars, seeing Yesiong getting angry, think he doesn't want to break his cosplay character. One beggar pulls out another saju from his bag and offers it to Yesiong, saying he'll crack it open just for him. He mentions that saju and Mikju mixed together are a harmonious mixture, like yin and yang in terms of martial arts. He claims that together, they exert immense power. While offering the drink, the beggar asks Yesiong to tell them the rest of the story. Yesiong says he'll think about it after drinking a bit of this. The beggar gets happy to hear that and starts mixing saju and mikju. Yesiong watches them mix the drink, and suddenly the ground where they are sitting starts to shine brightly. Yesiong gets excited, thinking that this drink is an elixir. He believes the saju is exuding potent energy. When the beggar sees Yesiong excited, he shouts that it couldn't be Samik. Kim recognizes the phenomenon despite only hearing about it and tells everyone that it's a gate break. The station gets covered by light, and suddenly everyone gets teleported into a different world where the sky is pink and rocks are flying. Yesiong is also teleported there and feels confused about the new place. People near him are equally bewildered. Yesiong analyzes the surroundings, stating it's like a plain but artificial, with no slopes or natural objects. He can't sense any bugs in the soil. Just like Yesiong, everyone else is confused. A guy suggests that maybe it's a game, but others shout that the SG is still operational, so how could this happen? Suddenly, a beggar notices something flying into the sky and points at an unknown person, telling everyone that there's someone floating in the air. As everyone looks, they see a man in a black hoodie flying into the sky. Yesiong, observing the person, wonders if they are using levitation. The person flying into the sky doesn't have a face and releases some unknown aura, saying, Nice to meet you, everyone. I am D13, the manager of this mission. While all this was happening inside the gate, outside at the safe gate Seoul Branch Command and Control Office, where the Korean government controls the monster gate, commanding officer asks the controller to report all the gel figures. The commanding officer of this safe gate Seoul Branch is Major General Han Jihoo. The controller starts to report that there are no anomalies in Jongno-gu, none in Kangdong-gu. A control said Jung-gu is clear, but he suddenly gets a new update on Jung-gu. A level 9 gel alert is coming from Jung-gu, the same place where Yesong is right now. The controller shouts, Commander Seoul Station's gel level has exceeded 9. Commando Jihu is too shocked to hear that. The reason Commander Jihu was so shocked is that if a gate's gel level exceeds 9, then it means a gate is about to break. Jihu asks them how it became like this. The controller responds that it certainly wasn't there a moment ago, but their sensors suddenly detected it. Commander tells the controller to show the Seoul Station CCTV and asks controllers to check who's the closest to Seoul Station right now. The controller checks and tells the commander that Class Awakena, Sun Changsu, lives near the station. Commander Jihu tells the controller to call him right now and tell him to head to the gate. He asks the controller what's the gate rating. The controller replies that it's at least E rank or maybe D rank. Commander Jehu is worried that if the gate isn't cleared on time, it will release a massive amount of energy and explode. The power of the explosion depends on the gate's rating and progression. The commander knows that if this gate explodes, important roads near Seoul Station will be destroyed, and the airport railroads would all be paralyzed. Worse, if it's a D rank, the nearby businesses and the greater downtown area could be reduced to ashes. The controller reports that the estimated groups of people who would be affected by the explosion would be the homeless, the station staff, 
and passers-by in the area. A controller who was talking to Sun Changs who told him to hurry up because there are only four minutes until the explosion. Suddenly, a controller sees something on his screen that is too shocking. He says, Commander, the gate is complete. This news is too shocking for Commander Jehu. On the other hand, inside the gate, the gate manager first congratulates everyone on being selected by the gate. He told them that the current number of participants in this gate is 214. When people hear that they are in a gate, they start to panic. They ask the manager to let them out, they don't want to do this. They all start to curse safe gate, wondering what the hell they are doing. An energy ball appeared above the gate manager, and he told everyone that from this moment moving forward, they must join forces to survive a seven-day attack. From that energy ball, the gate manager starts commencing a system scan. He tells everyone that once the scan ends, they should open their inventory and view their status window. All the people present there get surrounded by unknown energy. The manager tells them that the skill window, experience value quests, level up tab, and stat distribution window will also be accessible. Everyone is panicking, but Mr. Kim is calm because he knows that safe gate is well established, so regular civilians rarely ever get caught up in things like this. When the scanning ends, Mr. Kim is the first one to open his status window. He is a level 1 average human with normal stats. Mr. Kim accepts the fact that he is a little higher than the average person. While Mr. Kim is getting comfortable with the system, Yes Young is very confused about all this system and things, as he doesn't understand what he is seeing in front of him. He looks at the gate manager and shouts, Hey purple guy, let me ask you something. When everyone sees Ye Seong talk to the gate manager like that, they are all shocked and afraid that Ye Seong might anger the gate manager. People grab Ye Seong and shut his mouth with their hands, telling him to be quiet. A guy says, Ye Seong, if you provoke the manager, we're screwed. Can't you read the room? Ye Seong looks at that guy for a second, then he again shouts, Hey, you cheeky floating bastard, get down here. Everyone again stops Ye Seong. The gate manager himself is confused as he sees someone like Ye Seong for the first time. While leaving, he tells everyone that within 10 minutes, they should select their preferred weapon from their inventory, and after 30 minutes, the attacks will begin. He wishes them the best for these 7 days and disappears into thin air. When the gate manager left, everyone gets relaxed. A guy told Ye Seong that if he's going to do something stupid, do it away from them next time. They all start to open their inventory to select a weapon, as the gate manager told them. When Ye Seong saw them doing that, he also called the inventory, and a system window opened in front of him. The system asked him to please select the preferred weapon and showed seven weapons to choose from. Ye Seong said, what is this? I don't need one, and he cleared the system window with his hand. Except for Ye Seong, everyone else selected their weapon. Then Kim came to Ye Seong and asked him why he said that to the manager earlier. He told Ye Seong that if he messes up, they're all affected. Ye Seong told him that he just wanted to ask him something. Kim thought this guy really is a crazy guy. Kim grabbed his hand and asked him to follow them. Ye Seong asked why he should follow them, and Kim told Ye Seong to stay right next to him because that's the only way Ye Seong would survive. Another guy from Kim's group asked Kim if they can afford to take him along. Kim said, so what, would we just let him die then? Ye Seong was too impressed when he heard Kim talk like that. Ye Seong said, Kim, you will definitely be safe around me, and I'll protect you for sure. Kim said, you're definitely insane. But suddenly Kim noticed that Ye Seong is empty-handed. Kim asked Ye Seong about his weapon, and Ye Seong said, I don't need one, so I didn't get one. Kim got very angry at Ye Seong but didn't say anything, thinking that Ye Seong is crazy. He gave one of his weapons to Ye Seong, who said, I don't need one. Kim got angry and told him to just take it. Suddenly, a system message comes that the day one attack will begin shortly. Kim again offered that weapon to Ye Seong, but Ye Seong completely ignored him. He was looking where the sun was, confused because a sign showed up out of nowhere. First, he thought it was a group of 500 people, but when he looked closely, he realized that these things aren't human. Their weight measures in at over 120 kilograms. By numbers, mass, and speed, they easily surpass humans in every way. Those were chimpanzees. Everyone got scared just looking at the size of those chimpanzees. They could easily be 3 or 4 meters tall if they stood on their feet. Some make a run for their life, but some don't run and gather courage to fight the chimpanzees. A guy said, they're just a bunch of monkeys, this'll be easy. More people agree with him and stop to fight. Ye Seong takes the weapon Kim was offering. He knows that the quality of these monsters' muscles easily overwhelms human muscles. And if he doesn't make a move, all the people there are going to be wiped out. Ye Seong starts to walk towards those monsters. When Kim sees Ye Seong going there, 
He tries to stop him, but other people prevent him so that only one person dies. Kim shouts, you idiot, where are you going? It's dangerous out there, you can't leave the group. Ye Seong ignores him and continues to go forward. The monsters also get near, and now Ye Seong is just in front of those monsters. The chimpanzees look too fearsome as they are double the size of a human. The chimpanzees look at Ye Seong angrily, and Ye Seong looks into their eyes and says, Let me spread the doctrine of the heavenly demon cult upon these boorish creatures. All the chimpanzees surround Ye Seong and start to attack him from all directions. The people who see this scene get too scared, and the chimpanzees now look even more dangerous. Suddenly, they stop attacking. When the smoke clears, the chimpanzees see that Ye Seong is not there, and they were just attacking the ground. Ye Seong lands on a chimpanzee's head and says, The first doctrine of the heavenly demon cult is to give worship to the heavenly gods. That chimpanzee tries to attack Ye Seong, but Ye Seong jumps from its head. Now, Ye Seong has a rough idea of these chimpanzees' physical abilities. Ye Seong suddenly looks at them and says, Let's see how much you can handle. Now, the chimpanzees get scared when they see Ye Seong's red glowing eyes. They are so scared that they couldn't even move. Ye Seong raises his sword and hits a chimpanzee so hard that, along with that chimpanzee, others who are far also feel the power. The sword waves created by the data attack make a huge hole in the ground. With just one attack, one side of the chimpanzees gets to see their parents in heavens. System messages for level up start to come one after another. Ye Seong levels up many levels in one go, as he was the first one in his group to level up. So the Awakena protection system starts operating. Because of this, all the chimpanzees stop moving and freeze for the time being. A system message comes that after the next level up, the Awakena protection system will cease to function. And right now, a pause action is in effect. Ye Seong is surprised that, just like the system says, the chimpanzee's attack got paused. By killing some chimpanzees, Ye Seong gets 10 stat points. The system asks him to allocate his 10 stat points, warning that if stat points are not allocated within the next 10 seconds, they will be distributed randomly. When Ye Seong sees the new system message, he wonders if it's because of this that the chimpanzees stopped. He doesn't understand what he is supposed to do right now. The system starts to scan, but a scanning error occurred within the system. A message comes that the system is unable to quantify the target's capability values, and the scan was unsuccessful due to an unknown reason. The system decides that the player will be given a capability value of level 1 until the system scan is at normal operation. After some time, the system scan error was resolved and a message comes that stats acquired through leveling up will be applied equally. Ye Seong's status window appears, but even the system was unable to correctly identify him, and there were question marks all over his status window because Ye Seong didn't allocate stat points, and his 10 stat points were distributed randomly. The system gives 4 points to strength, 4 points to stamina, and 2 points to endurance. Some kinds of energy surrounded Ye Seong as his stats were distributed. When Ye Seong sees that the system gives him some kind of energy, he properly understands that this is the awakening that those others used to talk about. Ye Seong feels that his power is being forced into growing. He now fully understands that when someone defeats a monster in the gate, they awaken through that thing called the system. And the more they defeat, the stronger and more well-structured they become as a player. But all this is useless to Ye Seong because he is the heavenly demon lord of Murum. Not only does he have unlimited internal energy, but he can also change it to another form of energy. Ye Seong releases a large amount of internal energy from his body that makes him look too cool. He says, The martial arts I have accumulated are not just simple physical force. The only thing I can awaken to is myself. Still, the energy the system gives is as gentle as Mother Nature herself. Ye Seong starts to gather his internal energy into his hand and then transforms it all into his strength. Because Ye Seong is forced to increase his strength stats, a fatal error has occurred in the system. But Ye Seong doesn't stop and says, System, don't reject my power. Now that you're in my domain, escape is impossible. Because Ye Seong uses his internal energy, an unknown error is acquired into the system. Due to that, stat points are not distributed normally, as the system could not understand Ye Seong's internal energy, so the system lost his stat points. But Ye Seong does not stop and continues to increase his stats with his internal energy. Now that Ye Seong was using external force to level up, his level, which the system was controlling, returned to 1. When Ye Seong's level returned to 1, the first level up awaken a protection system also shut down. All the chimpanzees can now move as their pause action was released by the system. The chimpanzees again get fearsome and try to jump at Ye Seong, but this time Ye Seong does not give them a chance to fight. 
before those chimpanzees could land on the ground and attack him. He cuts down all the chimpanzees into pieces. Yes Young's eyes and swords are shining blue like water. And just like water, Yes Young's sword moves at his order and kills those chimpanzees. When Yes Young kills a chimpanzee, his level goes up, but the level up and the system's first level up awaken a protection try to start operating. But an error occurs every time, and his level returns to one. The system could not operate properly because of Yes Young who is using his internal energy. The most interesting thing is that, just like Yes Yang could convert his internal energy into another form, he could also convert the system's given energy into his internal energy. All this feels incredible to Yes Yang because just killing four of these chimpanzees will grant him half a year's worth of internal experience. Yes Yang gets too excited and forgets to struggle. The remaining chimpanzees who saw Yes Yang slicing other chimpanzees like pigs get really scared of him. Chimpanzees who were very scared of Yes Young start to run away, but as the Hell Reaper, Yes Young follows them to kill. The most scary thing is that he calls them lunch meat. Now the rules have reversed, and hunters have become prey. Other humans who saw Yes Young chasing those fearsome chimpanzees like that get really confused about who the real monster is. A new system message comes that an incredible first accomplishment of a player single handedly killing 100 Nuka warriors has been achieved. The system grants a rune to Yes Young. That rune is Nuka Tribe's Nightmare of Grade C. Yes Young gets a title, Nuka Tribe Hunter. Now, when he is fighting a Nuka Warrior, he will receive a 30% buff to all stats. A system message comes that the first achievement has been awarded only to one player, and up to 10 runes can be utilized. Whether or not to use a rune is up to the player. The system gives a choice to Yes Young if he would like to accept the rune. While killing those chimpanzees, Yes Young rejects it, saying, I don't need this. But many system messages pop up in front of his face, asking him the same thing. Despite him rejecting it multiple times, Yes Young gets very angry at the system and starts to swing his sword at the system. New system messages start to pop up, saying the player has displayed an incredible performance. Due to the player's feat, the prestige of clearing the first wave will be granted solely to the player. Yes Young gets angry and shouts, what the hell is that prestige? He tells the system that he doesn't need any of it, so don't give it to him. The system completely ignores Yes Young and activates the hidden piece. Yes Young is granted the rune, one who cares for humanity. This rune is a myth grade S rank rune. With this rune, the player receives a 30% boost to all stats. Yes Young says, this new rune looks nice, this will increase the amount of lunch meat that comes my way. Now Yes Young is equipped with the rune's protection. While Yes Young is checking the system and killing those chimpanzees, other humans are just looking from afar. All the people are amazed when they find out that Yes Young is strong as hell. Some are happy that they are still alive, and some feel relief thinking that they now have an awakener with them. But suddenly, a bagger said to everyone that if Yes Young clears all the attacks on his own, then they won't even be able to awaken when they exit the gate. When people hear what that bagger said, they agree with him. Since most of them are baggers, they need to awaken and get rich. Suddenly, Mr. Kim shouted, Are you guys insane? He warns them that they will die if they go to fight those monsters. Another bagger tells Kim not to worry, saying it looks like Yes Young is having a hard time all alone, so they need to help him. That bagger asks if anybody else wants to lend a hand, and many other baggers agree to fight with him. Mr. Kim's friends and others who have common sense don't join them. When Yes Young hears those baggers, he says, I have no reason to stop a fight that I chose willingly. Just make sure you win and become awaken us. When Yes Young doesn't stop them, all those baggers join the fight and start to attack those chimpanzees. After some time, all the chimpanzees have been killed. Yes Young is standing in the middle, surrounded by dead chimpanzees that he killed himself. Yes Young sees that some kind of blue smoke is coming out of those dead chimpanzees. Yes Young is not sure if it's just him or if there's actually some energy coming off their bodies. He says, it looks like they're smoldering away. Suddenly, many system notifications pop up, saying, you have obtained four Nuka Berserkers potion. This is a rare Nuka Berserker potion, an elixir to increase the Berserker's combat power. You also obtain 270 Dayron's leather. That is the skin of a Dayron, a domesticated animal of the Nuka tribe. You also obtain 6 Warriors Stimulant. It's a substance that increases one's physical power. Because of the pop-up sound, Yes Young's head starts to hurt. He is confused about what all of this is, and he shouts, isn't there a way to get rid of these things? The system takes Yes Young's words as an order, and the inventory notifications were disabled. The last system message comes, stating that the player can reset the notification function if desired. While Yes Young was dealing with the system, someone comes from behind. It was Mr. Kim, but he was very sad. 
He was sad because all the baggers who joined Yeseong to fight the chimpanzees are now dead. Mr. Kim says, Idiots, that's why I told you not to go. Awakening doesn't get you anywhere. When Yeseong sees Mr. Kim that's sad, he says, Sometimes you risk your life for the sake of ambition. When Mr. Kim sees Yeseong talking like that, he asks Yeseong how old he said he was. Yeseong replies, I haven't counted since I turned 100, so I don't know. Mr. Kim adds, and you said you were the prince of Korea. Yeseong confirms, saying, that's right. After hearing all that, Mr. Kim thinks it's incredible that Yeseong has such tremendous power. But, he wonders if Yeseong's awakening tampered with his mind. In summary, he thinks Yeseong is a crazy guy. Yeseong says, all that running made me hungry. Mr. Kim tells him that food and other survival items should be in everyone's inventory. While both of them were talking, all the people gather around them. A guy comes forward, calls Yeseong, and asks, Mr. Awakena, what should we do now? Yeseong is surprised by that question and asks why they would ask him that. When he sees them all scared, he tells them not to worry, saying, I'll carry all the monsters myself. A guy from the back raises his hand and says, I'm a public servant working at the Seoul subway station, so I know SG's guidelines for dealing with gates. He suggests that if there are civilians involved, awakening might increase their survival rate. Yeseong tells that public servant that he is not an awakener. The public servant doesn't believe Yeseong at all and asks if he is not with SG. Yeseong makes a martial arts stand and says, Nope, I am not an awakener. He asks that public servant if he has never heard of martial arts. Mr. Kim explains to that public servant that Yeseong is just his friend who has gone nuts. Yeseong gets angry at Mr. Kim, saying, What do you mean nuts? You still don't believe me, you bastard. Mr. Kim says, What are you talking about? How am I supposed to believe that you're from the Ming Dynasty? Yeseong says, I really am, and I made a gate to come here. Mr. Kim doesn't believe him even once and says, A gate, so you make them. You are incredible. Mr. Kim's expressions reveal that he thinks Yeseong is lying. Yeseong gets more angry at him, points at a guy in that crowd of people, and asks him to come out. That guy is surprised as to why Yeseong called him. Yeseong tells that guy that he is in charge of these kids. That guy acts confused and says, how am I supposed to? Yeseong cuts him in the middle and says, it's because you're the only awakener here. When everyone hears what Yeseong said, they all look at that man with suspicion. That guy, who was acting innocent up until now, gets very angry and asks Yeseong how he knew that. Yeseong replied, I felt the energies flowing through your body. I can see everything with my eyes. That man comes out from the crowd and said, You are more impressive than I thought. He said, That's right, I am an awakened named Kang Seryong. However, unfortunately, I am affiliated with CSG and I am Chinese. So according to the Untreaty, I cannot intervene in the affairs of other countries' gates. Yeseong put his hand on Kang's shoulder and said, If I tell you to do it, then do it. Kang replies that he cannot. Yeseong presses Kang's shoulder really hard and, while smiling, asks Kang if he is saying he won't do it. He asks, Is that treaty more precious than your own safety? It was a warning for Kang, and he understands it. While pressing his shoulder, Yeseong told Kang that he is the leader from now on. Kang thought, the world is vast, and there are many powerful ones, but how many are capable of strolling through the Nuka tribe alone, slaughtering hundreds as if on a casual walk? Kang thought that with his power, Yeseong could be among the top 200 in rankings, a high ranker. So how has he not become known in the world until now? Kang said, if no one else is awakened, then I'll do it. Yeseong turns around and says, great, I'll be the one in the battle, so you ensure that no one gets hurt. Kang tells him that it's unlikely to happen. He explains that he rank gates or higher do not get aggro from the second day onward. Yeseong gets confused and asks Kang what he is talking about. Kang asks Yeseong if he really does not know. He expresses how surprised he is that a high-ranking hunter doesn't know all this. Kang explains to Yeseong that since the administrator of this gate referred to himself as D1 degrees Celsius, and the administrator's codename contains information about the gate, D, the first letter, signifies the strength of the monster appearing in the gate. If the rank had been a bit lower, even those who died earlier would have safely defeated the monsters and become awakened. The middle number indicates the sequence of three missions, one for defense, two for offense, and three for raid. This gate is number one, so it's a defense mission. 
and the last character signifies the difficulty based on the total number of participants. The lower the total number of participants, the higher the difficulty becomes. F and E signify easy difficulty, D and C signify moderate difficulty, and lastly, B, A, and S signify hard difficulty levels. This gate is C, and the difficulty is moderate relative to the number of participants. Kang, after explaining all that, asks Ye Siong if he understands. Ye Siong, who got bored hearing all that. He said, understand roughly. Ye Siong was very nervous as he is not sure if Ye Siong really doesn't know all this or if he is pretending not to know. As Kang was very worried about his safety, he asked Ye Siong his name. Ye Siong said, my name is Wang Gu. Kang explained to Ye Siong that today is the first day, so the aggro didn't loosen up, and it was directed towards Wang Gu. But when tomorrow comes, it'll charge at the people. Then no one can avoid the battle. Kang suggested that he will lead and persevere, so Ye Siong has no choice but to deal with the monsters as quickly as possible. Ye Siong said, okay, as there doesn't seem to be any better option. Ye Siong asked Kang if leveling up is just a matter of defeating a few monsters. Kang said it varies for each monster, and as your level increases, the required experience points increase exponentially. Kang was confused about why Ye Siong keeps asking such questions. Is he just that ignorant, or is there another reason? Suddenly, a man comes to Kang and says, I am unawakened. How difficult is it to achieve a D grade? Kang told him that it's quite challenging. Kang simply told that awakener that it's different, but deep down, Kang knows that it's absolutely impossible for two awakeners to clear it together. Kang knows that even if Ye Siong exerts tremendous strength and clears the gate, it's highly probable that most civilians will die. News was circulating all around the world that it has been five days since a gate incident occurred at Seoul Station, the current hub of logistics in Asia. Scientists have been predicting the occurrence of gates through gel values. The gate that appeared this time is the world's first unranked gate disregarding gel values. On SG's official announcement, the Seoul Station gate is classified as rank D, and all participants are reported to be civilians. As for the number of participants, due to the significant inclusion of homeless individuals, the exact number of participants has not been determined. However, it is estimated to be between 200 and 230 people and not a single awakened individual has been included in the selected participants, and the probability of clearing the gate seems to be significantly low. Within the next 48 hours, if those individuals fail to clear the mission, the gate will explode. SG's sole branch commanding officer Jai Hu, who was watching the news, asked the deputy director about the evacuations of establishments within a 2-kilometer radius of the gate's location progressing. The deputy director reported that evacuation within a 1-kilometer radius has been completed. However, establishments within the 2-kilometer radius are refusing to evacuate, since evidence indicates that explosions beyond a 1-kilometer radius from a gate overflow have been exceptionally rare, until now. Jai Hu was very frustrated. He said, Is that trivial company more important when human lives are at stake? The higher-ups surely won't bother coming to work. Jai Hu said, Deputy Director, kindly record our strong recommendation. Journalists will arrive within the next two hours. If we send faxes, emails, and make calls right in front of them, the press will likely write articles like Corporate Ignorance of Gate Safety. Jai Hu asked him if the identities of the homeless individuals at Seoul Station have been identified. He asked Deputy Director if it is true that Captain Kim In Chung is involved. The deputy director said, Yes, Kim In Chung, former army officer, 43 years old, is in the gate. The deputy director continued, Captain Kim In Chung was a senior officer from the same army background as me. Due to his unwavering sense of justice that couldn't tolerate injustice, he was discharged dishonorably. But he is respected among fellow army veterans. Jai Hu said, It would be great if Mr. Kim could lead people and clear the gate. The deputy director reported that there is no information or leads on the peculiarly dressed man who was next to Captain Kim in Chang. The one described as a peculiarly dressed man is Ye Siong. The deputy director said, I thought the distinctive clothing would make him easy to find, but he seems as inconspicuous as someone who just appeared out of nowhere. There are no false reports either. Not having a face on the CCTV is suspicious in itself, and there are various other questionable aspects. Jai Hu told the deputy director that since everyone related to the incident entered the gate, there's no way to find out. So we have no choice but to wait until two days after the gate opens. With a sad expression, Jai Hu said, maybe everyone inside might already be dead. As time passes, the gate explosion time comes, the countdown started. 4, 3, 2, 1. And just when the countdown ended, a large amount of energy started to come down from the sky. Jai Hu, who was watching from the control room, was confused. 
He asked if the gate hadn't exploded. Could it be that they cleared a D-rank gate? At the Seoul Station, the whole sky got covered by lightning, and a tremendous amount of energy fell on the ground. With that light, survivors of the gate started to come out. The one leading them was Kang, who was carrying Mr. Kim on his back. Kang could not believe that Ye Seong almost single-handedly defeated all those monsters. And then, on their way out from the gate, Ye Seong disappeared. It was hard for Kang to believe if he is awake or if he is dreaming right now. Kang and all the survivors come out of the gate. 